Today's video was recorded on May 9th, 2023, and today's lesson is the first in a new series that we're calling Bible 101. So this Bible 101 series is going to be covering some of the foundational concepts that we find in the Bible. And it's really here to help you solidify or strengthen the foundations of your own faith. And so the topics that we'll be covering first, and these are really, these are the absolute foundations of the Bible, are redemption and covenant. So God has a plan, and it's called the plan of redemption. And this is where God is going to, or we could say he's in the process of, redeeming humanity and the cosmos from the chaos that we find ourselves in today. That's the idea of redemption. But where does the concept of redemption come from? And then how can we understand it from the perspective of an ancient Israelite? And that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Now, a second is that God is a God who covenants with his people. That was not normal in the ancient world for their gods to make covenants with them. And this is really a significant matter because covenants define relationship. When you join into relationship with somebody with a covenant, it helps you define that relationship like marriage is a covenant. It's a marriage covenant. So God's plan of redemption, well, it's carried out through a series of covenants. And the Bible itself is a covenant document. Now, we happen to say testament, and we'll talk about why that is in our lesson tonight. But at its core, the Bible is a covenant document. It helps us understand our relationship with God. Now, if we know that the Bible is a covenant document, well, what are the details of covenant? Why was this so important to the ancient Israelites? How does covenant help increase our confidence in the God we follow? So there's so much wrapped up in the idea of covenant that this will really help you see deeper into the Bible. Now, of course, with a series like this, there are so many details to keep track of. And if you've never looked at redemption and covenant in a detailed manner, this may seem new to you. So we've provided handouts to help you. So make sure you check the show notes below for links to our website. And there you'll be able to download a PDF of the class handout or a PDF of any of the other information we'll be providing. So we hope you enjoy this first of a couple lessons on redemption and covenant, and then also this entire upcoming series, Bible 101. And we believe it'll really help you strengthen or solidify the foundations of your faith. So enjoy tonight's lesson. So I'm going to call this series Bible 101, because literally it is like we're going right back to the very basics of the Bible. And it's almost like if you can build the framework of redemption and covenant, you build that framework and all the rest of the pieces fit inside that framework and they begin to make sense. And sometimes what I think we're lacking is the basic framework. We make assumptions that everybody knows what you mean by redemption or what you mean by covenant or what kind of book. As I just said, if we hand somebody the Bible, Hey, welcome to church. Here's your Bible. Okay, go for it. It's like, well, what did we just hand them and how can we explain it that gets right to the very bottom, the base of what the Bible is? So that's redemption and covenant. Okay, and this will be part one. Like I said, I think we're going to do five, uh, five parts to this. And you'll never be able to cover it all, but I think five should give us enough of a base. And then I chose. Um, for the background picture today, and I think what you'll see, this is a rendering of the prodigal son. And that story, that prodigal son story is so powerful. But I think you'll see, we take this story, as we go through tonight and talk about redemption and covenant, particularly redemption, this story will take on a little bit different light. We'll get to the end and come back to it. Because at the heart of this story is the message of redemption. The father, who's the representative in the parable, he represents God. The son who rejected the father's house, who leaves 
gets wrapped up in his own circumstances and then says, Ay, I gotta go back. And the father welcomes him home, puts him, you know, back into the, his rightful place in the household. And that's the, it's a great picture of the father's house. If we have that imagery in our mind where we can say, oh, I see, this is a regular story of the Bible. And it's exactly why Jesus is telling that, using it as a parable. Now, there are elements missing, but at the core, right? At the core, this is a story of redemption. God wants to bring his children, right? To use that father-child metaphor back into the father's house. The prodigal son illustrates that perfectly. Okay, so as I mentioned, the goal of this series, we want to illuminate the very basics of the Bible and the biblical story. And again, that's, found, that's redemption and covenant. So redemption is the plan. Redemption is what God is doing. Covenant is the mechanism of relationship. How do we relate to God? We relate to God through a covenant. And again, I think what happens in church, in church, and again, this is a general, generalized statement, but I think it's true, we often make assumptions, right? Somebody may, becomes a Christian, they go to church, we make assumptions about what they think these words mean, what kind of conceptual framework these words give us. And I'll talk, I'll show you a book later. It's called The Metaphors We Live By, classic book about the idea of metaphors and how important those metaphors, they affect how we envision the world, how we move in the world, how we act in the world. And these metaphors show up in the Bible, or metaphors do show up in the Bible. So they provide us a conceptual framework. And when we say words like salvation, redemption, covenant, offering or sacrifice, even gospel, what's, what, is the, what do you mean by the good news? And I would find, one thing I would find in seminary is very often, even with seminarians, they would just start a class assuming that we all have the same definition on these very basic ideas. And so what I, I think is important and what I want to do is illuminate these basic ideas so that we would say to somebody, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by whatever the word is? Make sure that we're in agreement on either a definition or a conceptual thinking. And what you'll see over and again as we go through this, the Bible, because it's an Eastern book, they never give you a definition, right? We Westerners, we want the Bible to be like a textbook, you know, with illustrations and graphs. And we did a survey, nine out of 10 theologians agree, it means this. We love that data. We want definitions of everything. The, the Bible doesn't do that. You want a definition of redemption? Read the book of Exodus. Read the story of Hosea. And you go, oh, that's redemption. They illustrate redemption. So if you ask Jesus a tough question, he'll tell you a story. And then he doesn't give you the story. He doesn't give you the answer to the story. He just walks away. You wrestle with it, you know. So that's the Bible. And I think when you see that, if we can even convey in, in story, even today, to people about these ideas, that stories have a, a way of gripping us that definitions don't. Okay, so uh, number one on your handout then. By the way, I'm putting together, it's about three to four, maybe, well, the first one's probably three pages, then I'll have another one that is probably is two pages. I, I just, I did a write-up, uh, this is what I was doing over the past couple of weeks, on Covenant. So I wanted to give a handout that you could then print off or download and read on your computer that just gives you a little bit more uh, than listening does so that you can read it and reflect on it uh, on your own. Okay, number one. So the foundations, as I mentioned, redemption. Redemption is God's plan. Now, we'll see tonight and we'll see throughout this series, um, God uses ideas from the culture that he's speaking to, to communicate. So God has a plan, and he uses the cultural idea of redemption to then explain to the people of Israel what his plan is. And again, he doesn't give a definition. They say, ah, I know what redemption is, therefore I know what God is doing. So redemption is the plan. 
covenant then is the relationship. The easiest thing to think about is a marriage, a marriage covenant. You go to a marriage ceremony. There are rituals that you do, things that you say, agreements that you agree to in front of a group of witnesses. That's a covenant. And a covenant defines relationship. So we are in relationship with God. God is a God who wants to covenant. And then so, okay, well, if God's a God who wants to covenant, then we need to understand covenant. Because that's profound to those ancient Israelites as God is showing up saying, here's what I'm going to do. Particularly like when we did our stuff about Exodus, you know, they lived under a tyrannical king. And then God says, okay, now I'm going to be your king, but I'm different, right? I have a different character than the king you were just under. But he's going to communicate that through establishing a covenant relationship with them. Okay, so these are the two main ideas. Now, again, I think this is something that maybe we even miss in our just in our regu on regular church going, that our Bible is a covenant document. Now, the unfortunate part is that we use the word testament instead of covenant. I'll talk about the differences in a minute here. The Bible is a covenant document. It speaks of the relationship between God and humanity. And so we have two sections, right? Two sections to our Bible. And we have the older covenants, and then we have the newer covenant. And I'm going to intentionally not use what we're used to because I want you to think about what's going on here. So the older covenants. First of all, I think what happens is when you say Old Testament, what's the implication by using the term old? It's outdated. We don't need it anymore, right? We can tend to be judgmental towards it. You even find this in churches. Churches will hand out a New Testament alone. I get it. I understand why they want to do that. They want to get the New Testament into the hands of someone who would be intimidated by the enormity of the Old Testament. But when you give out the New Testament without the, without the other testament or without the other covenants behind it, how can you understand what's going on? And so, to use the term old, again, I know that we do, and I know you guys know what I'm talking about, but they're older covenants, right? And so these older covenants, and we'll do this in order as we go through, and over the next few weeks, you'll see all of these, you'll become familiar with them. It starts with Adam. That's the first covenant even though it's, it's a loosey-goosey covenant, but Adam, then you have a covenant with Noah. That one is straight up, tells us. You have a covenant with Abraham. That one's important because Abraham is for Abraham and his descendants. How do you get inside that covenant? That's an argument that's being made in Ephesians and Galatians. How are we supposed to get inside that covenant? Paul says, well, just like Abraham got inside the covenant, through faith. That's how everybody else enters that covenant. So you have Abraham, you have Moses, and then David, and all of them are drilling into a very fine point. And then the next covenant that's going to happen, as we read in Jeremiah, is God says, I will give them a new covenant. And of course, Jesus is the pinnacle of the covenants. Because now this is going to explode out to the whole world so that through Jesus, Anybody can enter the covenant. Wait, you mean you don't have to be circumcised? No. You just have to believe. You have to have faith. And God brings you into the covenant relationship. So covenant is all about establishing a relationship. We access God, right? We access our relationship to God, and so does the rest of the world, through the newest of the covenants. And then Jesus is not only the covenant mediator, but his death is the ratifying sacrifice that you need to establish that covenant. That covenant. And we'll talk more about doing the uh, cutting, what it means to cut a covenant, the, the ratification ceremony, which involves a sacrifice. That's what Jesus 
death represents. So, just a thought. They're all still very important to us. And so, again, using the, I know we say Old Testament new, but realize they're all still relevant to us in some way, shape, or form. Okay. Right there, there's your, if if you could memorize that order, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, those are the covenants that come through the Bible. And so that makes up, there you go, there you've, you've, you've 90% of your way to organizing the Old Testament to the New. Okay, now, next question, number three, why do we call our Bible Testament then? Where did we get that from? And I want to include this because we miss the fact that we, we're holding a covenant in our hand, and covenant is about relationship. Testament, well, that's different. A last will and testament, that's a disposition of assets after you die. So, in the ancient world, covenants are foundational to the, co- to the, the uh, culture. And I would even argue today, covenants are foundational, especially like here in the United States. So much of what we do is based off of trust. Now, we might call a mortgage contract a contract, but it's a covenant in a way. Both parties agree to do something. Everybody agrees in advance. You sign on the dotted line. That's in lieu of sacrificing a goat. But that's where you, when you're signing on the dotted line, in the ancient world, you sacrificed a goat. And then everybody has obligations to those. So covenants are foundational to the culture. I think they still are today. And then God uses covenant covenant making as a way of helping the Israelites understand their relationship. You don't know who this God is yet. And what, like we'll see in a couple of weeks, Abraham, it's so poignant when you understand what God's up to. God says to Abraham, uh, I'm going to give you a lot of kids. I'm going to bless your kids. Abraham doesn't say, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. He says, but how will I know? How do I know God? Come on, give me something concrete. God says, okay, go get this animal, this animal, this animal, this animal, we're going to make a covenant. Abraham says, got it. Soon as he does that, he now has faith in God. He has enough faith in God that he walks his son up towards the top of the mountain. His son says, where's the sacrifice, dad? He says, God's going to provide the sacrifice. And we're both going to come back. That's remarkable. How did he know that? Because he made a covenant. And that's how strong covenants are in the ancient world. Okay, so let's look here. Um, you know, I was trying to figure out how do you present this, but let's just talk about the difference between covenant and testament, because it comes from, in our English, it comes through the King James or some of those older translations. So in Hebrew, I'm just going to walk through this. In Hebrew, the word is berit, that's covenant. In Greek, diatheke. So berit just means covenant. It's the And really, when we think New Testament, you have to go, okay, but the New Testament is based off of everything in the Old. The Old Testament is all about that Berit, the Hebrew, ancient Near East, Berit covenant. And the word Berit, the root of it has something to do with between, the idea of between. So what is a covenant between? Well, it's between two parties or two people. So two people are coming together in an agreement, and that that con or covenant then holds them together. So it has some sense of between, and that's exactly how it's used. Okay, then in the Greek, well, in the Greek, we have a problem. So diatheke can mean covenant. And when they translated the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek, it's called the Septuagint, somewhere around 250 BC, they used diatheke for berit as covenant. Okay, so what? Well, the problem is, is in, within classical Greek writing, the word diatheke can also mean a testament. Now, a testament, that's different. A testament is like a last will and testament. It's the disposition of property after death. And very early on, when we translated the English, uh, King James, the, old, the, the older Bible versions that were translated into English, when they got to that word diatheke, they translated it testament instead of covenant. Hence, in English, we call it New Testament, Old Testament, instead of New Covenant, Old Covenant. 
And that little detail can change the way that we think about. Now, most people never even ask, what does testament mean? But testament is about disposition of, of property after death. But covenant, that's what we want to look at. Covenant is all about the relationship. How do we enter the relationship with God? What covenant are we under? Ah, the new covenant with Jesus. He's our, he's our sacrifice. He's the ratification sacrifice. He's the atoning sacrifice. He's the sacrifice. He's every, he's all the, he represents every single sacrifice that you could get. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. I just want to make sure that we're aware when we get our English, how we refer to this book, that there is a little bit of a problem between testament and covenant, and that it really should be covenant. But, well, now we know, right? It's like a public service announcement. Now you know. Okay. Number four. As we go through this, we always have to go back to one of the most important things. It's very difficult to do because not only do you have to read your Bible, but you have to study the surrounding cultures. So these covenants are part of the ancient way of life. They're everywhere. Everything you do is done with a covenant. And then God is going to use that, right? Use those cultural metaphors to help communicate his will to humanity. And this is always the struggle because what can we know about the ancient cultures? How did they think about things differently than we think about them? And one of the problems we have and the reason that we use metaphors is that we, as limited human beings, how do we understand the will of an unlimited, eternal, altogether different God? And so when God says, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to communicate my will to you, he communicates that meaning through the cultural metaphors of their day. That's how we understand them. So if we're going to understand the Old Testament, we need to do a little bit of work around these metaphors. And once you do, it's like, boom, they jump out. Ah, that makes sense now. So first note that I have here, the idea of culture and language are always intertwined. You understand culture through the language. You understand the language through the culture. They're always intertwined. And so whenever we study the Bible, you have to go to the culture and then look at the words of the Bible, and then fit, try to fit it as best you can into that culture. We, would, we could do the same thing here in the United States if we took some time to look at the culture of the United States compared to other parts of the world. But that culture and language are always intertwined. There's a, I don't know exactly who to attribute it to, but there's a saying scholars, um, particularly Old Testament scholars, will say, uh, the Bible doesn't mean what it says, it means what it means. And what, that's, the, that's their way of saying, so saying that the Bible doesn't mean what it says, it means what it means, is a way of articulating that there can be phrases or things in the Bible that have idiomatic meaning, it's an idiomatic phrase, in an ancient culture. So it doesn't mean exactly what it says on the paper, but it means what it means. But that's how we have to understand culture and language. Then God shows up, says, okay, I'm going to communicate through that culture. So that when I want to tell you about my plan, it's going to be in the form of the things that you know about. When I create a relationship with you, it's in the, the, the things that you know about. So God uses those cultural metaphors. Very important that we do a little bit of work on what these cultural metaphors are. Now, one book, I put this little quote, and I put a footnote at the bottom. This is a book, I think, published in, let's see, 1980. It's called The Metaphors We Live By. Now, it's very dense into all the way that metaphors work. So if you didn't want to do all the, read the entire book about metaphors, go to the library. Just read the first few chapters. It actually really helps you think about the way the Bible works. Because metaphors are not just, uh, the way that we conceptualize the world is through metaphor. And especially the unknown of God. 
So this is a really good book. It's obviously not a Christian book, but it will actually help you understand the metaphors of the Bible and then how we, how we can conceptualize God. Okay, so there's one quote here, and he says, the essence of a metaphor and it's both understanding and experiencing. This is what the power of a metaphor is. We move in the world due to the metaphors of the way that we conceptualize things. So the essence of a metaphor is understanding and experiencing one kind of thing in terms of another. So we can't know God in totality. We can know him sufficiently but not in totality, right? God says, my ways are not your ways. And so the Bible, and then we do it as well, we use metaphors to understand aspects of God, to help us relate to him in ways that would be too difficult if we didn't have that metaphor. So for instance, and this is what we see with both redemption and covenant, is the cultural metaphors of father, husband, king. Now, there's more. God's a shepherd. God's a judge. God's like a nursing mother. Those are all metaphors. But father, husband, king, when we talk redemption and covenant, so you'd say, ah, God is like a father. Well, how? Well, the father is responsible in the ancient world for redemption. I'll show you that at the end. How's God like a husband? Well, God wants his presence to dwell intimately and it's so intimate that the word they use for redemption is taking a wife in marriage. Right? When, when the New Testament says the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is near, it's that near. It's the intimacy of between a husband and wife. That's how intimate God wants to dwell with us. God is, a ki- God is like a king. Well, how is he like a king? Well, he's gonna, a king will covenant with his people. So these are the metaphors that we use to explain something about God that's going to help us then have a more concrete understanding of our relationship. So father, husband, king, those are the main ones when it comes to our topic. Okay, now let's turn the page over. If we were Easterners, we'd never give a definition, but we're not Easterners, we're Westerners, right? So in the East, you tell a story. In the West, you give a definition. So if you turn your page over, I'm going to give you a definition, because that's what we like to see. If you're going to get any book, and the reason I put this book here is because the, the definition of redemption, this is Sandra Richter's definition in her book. This book is called The Epic of Eden. The most accessible and the least expensive way, because it's not a very expensive book, to learn more about redemption and covenant and what we're talking about, get this book. She is a great teacher and has an amazing ability to explain these concepts. So the Epic of Eden, this is her definition out of this book. Um, Okay, so redemption. I'm going to read it once, and then we'll go back and kind of pick it apart. So the act of a patriarch putting his own resources on the line to ransom a family member who had been driven to the margins of society by poverty, or who was seized by an enemy against whom he had no defense, or who found themselves enslaved by the consequences of a faithless life. In other words, they were sinning. And then redemption restores them to the rightful place in their kinship circle. So let's go through this one more time just to talk about the details. The act of a patriarch. That's the father. The ancient Near East is a patriarchal society. Everything is governed by the father. He puts his own resources on the line, whether it's money, people from his household, or his only son. So the father puts his only son on the line to do what? He's going to go ransom. And that word ransom in the Bible is the yom. We did that on Yom Kippur. Kippur means a, a ransom, but it's a, it's a reconciliation. The patriarch, the father, is going to send his only son to reconcile a family member. Oh, this is wonderful. This is good news, isn't it? What happened to the family member? Well, any number of things. And now you get some examples, and we'll go through, through some of these in the Bible. 
um, driven to the margins of society by poverty. Uh, you, you might think, look, the book of Ruth. No fault of Ruth's. You know, Ruth, it wasn't her fault. There was a, there was a, a, a famine. So driven to the margins by, of society by poverty. Seized by an enemy who, had, who you had no defense. Who's the strong enemy that opposes God? So if you're seized by a, an, uh, a strong enemy, you found yourself enslaved by the consequences of a faithless life. Isn't that the, that's the prodigal son story? He leaves the house. He leaves the father's house. And he finds himself now trapped. In the, and the pigs are eating better than him. And I'll, I'll show you an example in the end, but that's the imagery when we talk redemption. It's about the patriarch ransoming back his people. And that's the, that, of course, is the story of the Bible. So when we think God's plan for redemption, right below that definition box there, God wants to redeem humanity, right? The fall from Adam and Eve. He's going to redeem humanity out of that. He's going to redeem actually the whole cosmos. He's going to restore the whole cosmos. And as I've mentioned a number of times, when you think about this, you can think people, place, and presence. So the people of God living in the place of God, just like Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, with the presence of God. That's the beginning of the story. That's Genesis 1 and 2. And then you go to the end of the story, Revelation 21 and 22. It's the same thing. It's now the new Jerusalem descends and the bridegroom is coming to get his bride. That's the wedding metaphor. And the people of God will be in the place of God with the presence of God. That's the beginning of the story. That's the end of the story. That's the plan of redemption. We are participating in that. And you can, one, say, okay, you're going to be redeemed. That's part of our salvation. But also, God's like, help me redeem the world. Go out and find the brokenness of the world and do something about it. Be my hands and feet in the moment. And so we participate in the redemption of the world right now. That's what Christian service is all about. So that's, that's redemption. Now, number six. Again, we'll talk more over the next few weeks. Number six is just to give you a definition of covenant, right? How can we be sure that God's relationship and his promises are solid? Well, he creates a covenant. And since we know covenant, it gives them the confidence, right? And then you'd say, can God break his side of the covenant? Because that even part of his character, can he violate his own covenant? No, we're not worried about God violating the covenant. We're worried about us, right? And he, he decided, you know what? Even if these people are going to break my covenant, I'll still be in relationship with them. That's how much I want them to be in relationship with them. So when we have faith about the promises of God, it's because there's a covenant involved. And those are serious, serious business, not so much anymore you know, in our world today. So let's do the same thing with covenant. A little shorter definition. By the way, this one comes from the Anchor Bible Dictionary. Now that's a great resource, but you got to be, I would not recommend starting with the Anchor Bible Dictionary. It's six volumes and uh, it's not exactly the cheapest thing to purchase, but it is a great resource. Okay, so what does this say, covenant? Well, it's an agreement. It's enacted between two parties in which one or both make promises under oath to perform or refrain from certain actions stipulated in advance. Doesn't that sound like a mortgage contract? Hey, I want to take out a mortgage. Well, that's an agreement between you and the bank. Both of you are going to make promises. And you're going to, well, in this case, sign on the dotted line. That's your oath. Now. In the ancient world, the promises and the oath were made with a sacrifice. And what we'll see is the blood of that sacrifice comes to represent your blood. The wages of sin is or are death. Or if you go see a wedding ceremony, you say your vows, 
and then you say, till death do us part. Nothing is going to break this marriage covenant but death. That's how serious it is. And maybe today we could, you know, maybe it would actually do us some good to bring back in the, the blood, uh, blood path ceremony to say, oh no, you do not violate that covenant. Because nowadays, marriage is just, eh. Anyways, that's a little preachy. But you get my point. And what you're going to see, this is going to blow your mind, is that when Abraham says, God, how am I going to know? And then he says, get these animals. We'll cut them in half. We're going to do a covenant ceremony. And what God does in that Abrahamic covenant ceremony will blow your mind if you know covenant. Because God's going to commit himself not just to his side of the covenant, but to our side too. God will take the penalty if you sin, and he does. So it's really cool. Okay, so there's promises. There's an oath to be made. You have obligations to perform or refrain. That's what a marriage is too, right? You can't get married and go on with your single life. You've got obligations to perform or refrain from certain actions, and all of this is stipulated in advance. God's not despotic. He's not a totalitarian. He doesn't force you into this covenant relationship. He says, here's the covenant. Would you like to join? Yes, I would. Okay, great. Come on in. So he wants you to agree to that voluntarily. Very important, and we'll break apart covenants as we go through this. Okay. Uh, Again, this is all introduction, so if if it seems like I'm moving fast, well, we'll we'll pick it up over the next couple weeks. By the time we're done, you'll see it so many times over and over that it'll, it'll be reinforced. Okay, now, underneath covenant and underneath redemption, and I'm going to do this fairly quickly, but how do we conceive God? How do we understand God in the Bible? Right? I mean, some people see God as an angry God. You know, maybe it's their own anxiety, their guilt. Uh, some people see God as only a God of compassion, but very little judgment. And h- how we read the Bible is going to affect how then we conceive of our relationship to God or who God is. And so there are ideas in the Bible that really, it it actually does depend on how we understand them, whether it's a positive or a negative. It'll color our view of the Old Testament, okay? So what I want to do is talk about three of them, and this will come, well, we'll, again, we'll do it more when we go over the next couple weeks. Three words that in English almost always have a negative connotation, almost always in English, They're, that's negative. But in Hebrew, completely different. Changes the way you read the text if you understand the way that the Jewish people or the way that the Bible, the, the original word, the original Hebrew word. Okay, the words are Torah or law, commandment and offering or sacrifice. Okay, so I have these three on your, on your handout. And I'm going to give you the English, I'll give you the underlying Hebrew, and then I want you to, I'm going to give you the underlying Hebrew concept, because that's what we miss. So in English, we say law. Now, if you think of law, is that positive connotation, negative connotation? And for most people, law is negative. That's just traditionally. We're like, wah, wah, law, not good. Now, in Hebrew, though, the word is Torah, Torah. And Torah does not mean law, although there may be some laws in there, but it's not, that word does not mean law. The word means to teach, to guide, to instruct. And the first five books of the Bible are called the Torah. It's not the law like a bunch of rules. It's a guidebook. It's a teaching manual. It's an instruction manual. God created you, then put the user manual in the glove box said, here, you're going to need this one day because you're going to go off the path and I need to help you get back on the path. And so the Hebrew concept is so much richer and deeper that when you open up your Old Testament, Genesis through Deuteronomy, that you don't think negative connotation law, that you think this is a guidebook for life. And so I'm going to view it that way, right? And yes, some of those cultural stuff, they're outdated. I get it. But much of that Old Testament is still, the precepts still apply. They transcend, especially the ethical or moral precepts, well, they transcend cultural norms. 
I, I get it. There are cultural things that are that don't. But I want you to understand that. Okay. So law. Every every scholar, Old Testament scholar and Hebrew scholar will tell you law is a bad translation. You got to understand what Torah means. Second, command or commandment. Uh, in Hebrew, the word is mitzvah. So you might go to a bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah is a son. Bar is son. It means for a boy that they're now under the commandments of God. They're at the age of uh, accountability. If it's a female, you go to a bat mitzvah, the daughter. Now, we think command, again, kind of negative, like we don't like to be commanded to do things. But in Hebrew, that word mitzvah, it has at its root, and also in the Aramaic, an idea of to bond or to connect. And so for the Jewish people, they don't see commandments as a, as a burden. They see them, this is my chance to connect with God. Right? If God is truth, how do you connect with truth? Well, you have to tell the truth, and you have to live in truth, and that's your way of connecting with God. And so, commandments, well, those are positives, and it's helpful to read those. That's how we bond to God. When we love our neighbor, even when we don't feel like we should, that's how we bond to God. Okay? So, commandment, again, kind of negative. And then the last one, offering or sacrifice, the word is korban. And um, the root for korban, which is karab, it means to come near, to approach. How do you approach God? Well, something has to be sacrificed. You can't just approach God without something being, he's holy and you're not. How do we approach God? We approach God through the sacrifice of Jesus. So the offering or the sacrifice, you know, yes, the sacrificial system is so foreign and outdated. I agree. But there's there's real power in the idea that it's through that that we come near that we come near to God. So we approach Him through an offering. We have to prepare ourselves even to to approach approach God. So okay, so even offering, you we miss something about it. And so we'll come back to all of these. I just wanted to introduce them to you. But we have a God who wants to covenant with us. It's all relational. It's very relational. God wants to teach us, to guide us, so that we're not straying too far off the path. He wants to bond with us and connect with us through these commandments that bring us closer to Him. Just like us doing, um, you know, the Eucharist is a way of coming closer to God. We have to give something up to move towards God. That's the idea of the sacrifice. Again, more on that later. And then let's finish with this. So, I'll give you the ancient idea concept of redemption. This helps us envision rather than a definition. It helps us envision what redemption means. So I'm going to show you a picture here. So I took this picture. It was about the month of May in Iraq, southern Iraq, about 100 miles south of Baghdad during the war in 2003. So end of, towards the end of May, because I'll show you the harvest had already happened. They, they were doing a lot of harvesting while we were there right about the time of Pentecost. And what you're looking at here, because this is outside the city, so it's way, I mean, this is very traditional living, no electricity, no plumbing. It's very traditional living. But this is one family's compound or patriarchal compound, because it's built around the father, and we could say it's the father's house. Because the the number one person in that group of everybody that lives there is the, el the elder uh, male, the father. And so you look at that and you say, well, if that's the father's house, then how many rooms are in there, the father's house? How many rooms are in the father's house? Well, there are many rooms in the father's house. So all of that becomes, this is now the metaphor. This is the patriarchal compound. The family builds up around the eldest male. The daughters, if he has daughters, they'll be married off. They go live with their husband's father, and then the sons build up the household around it. So you might have three, four, five generations within that one family compound, which would give you the idea of the sins of the father are passed down to the third and the fourth generation. Because if the father of a patriarchal household sins, everybody suffers underneath him. Now, it was harvest time, so... If you notice, everybody's little household 
has a pile of wheat. So that's a threshing floor where that yellow circle is. These are threshing floors. This is a threshing floor. This is a threshing floor. They bring the wheat in, very traditional, throw the wheat up in the air, let the wind blow the chaff away, and the wheat falls to the ground. So, okay, that's the, the father's house. Now, here's what happens. That becomes the central feature of the community, of the society in that ancient time. So you have the father, the patriarch, and his number one person, the, the second most important person in that household is his son, eldest son. So the eldest son sits at the right hand of the father. Okay? Then the father's house builds up around that. You get all these other family units, cousins and aunts and uncles and whatever, are all in that compound. Now, what happens if one of those family units, either individual or the whole family, gets caught out? Now, they're caught out. Why? Well, it might be a famine. It might be their own bad decision. It might be like the prodigal son. It might be whatever. But one of those family units gets caught out. What does the father do? Well, he's go back to our definition of, of redemption. He has to put his own resources on the line to ransom those people back in. And so his number one resource is his eldest son. He sends the eldest son out to get the family, to get the person who's caught out, and to bring them back home. That is the story of the Bible. God sent his son to bring us home. It's as simple as that. But that's the picture of redemption. It's all about the Father's house. And so, now what's cool, you know, when Jesus says, you know, you can hear those words, right? That metaphor. There are many rooms in the Father's house. And the Father is a metaphor, but so is marriage. And when Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, that's marriage language. That's a son who's going to take a bride. The engagement lasts for about one year. And all that time during that one year, that new, brand new husband is preparing a room for his bride so that one day he'll go back and get his bride. We don't know the day or the hour. Only the father knows. He goes back to get his bride, and they consummate the marriage. That's what we're waiting for. That's how intimate God is gonna, wants to dwell with us one day. So it's, a, it's an amazing metaphor that helps us understand the Bible. And if we go back to this picture, now you can see that prodigal son got caught out. You know, He made a mistake. If you were another family member, how would you feel when that prodigal son comes walking back in and God or the father says, welcome home, son, I've been waiting for you. You're like, you're angry. You're mad at that brother who left. So I think this really takes on, it's, it's the, you know, he rejected that father's house. He was enslaved by the circumstances of a faithless life and the father welcomed him back anyways. And that's our life too. We stray and God says, come on back home. So, okay. That's redemption, and it's the power of not just a definition, but seeing the picture, the cultural uh, picture that's happening. They got it, what, uh, what God was going to do. It's very, it's very much concrete. It's not abstract like a definition. Okay, real quick. So, redemption is the plan. That's al always the plan. Covenant is the relationship. How do we enter relationship with God? What kind of relationship are we in with, with God? We've got to understand covenant. We have cultural metaphors abound. Father, husband, king. This is how we understand God, through those cultural metaphors. I mentioned briefly, and I know it was quick, Torah, commandments, offering, all of them have a much deeper sense. It's all relational. God is going to give us the best he can to help us walk the path. And then the idea, of course, of the Father's house that is central to the society, central to the idea of redemption really provides a much more concrete picture for us of what redemption is. Okay, so that's uh, part one of our very Bible 101. I wish, honestly, I wish this class would have been taught day one in seminary, and all the students get the same foundational idea of what redemption and covenant are. Again, what you get is assumptions rather than something solid. So I want to be able to provide this for everybody to solidify what we know about the Bible.